Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to an abbreviated episode here in our Max Colonization series. And I say abbreviated because I need to get this recorded and edited as quickly as possible before we get hit by a hurricane tomorrow. You can see here that we have a little bit of mess, and that's because we're suffering from a little bit of radiation poisoning. And that's due to the construction of what I'm affectionately calling the Radbolt Reactor. You may recall that we had the material study terminal over here on Frostalin. Unfortunately, it was taking a lot of power and a lot of time. So we removed the Radbolt generation here and are busy building a box around this. We're going to put plastic in on this side to try to prevent as much of the rads coming through as possible. On the top, the left, and the bottom, we can put three layers. But on this side, our main ladder spine goes right through it, so it's not a big deal. Once we put the plastic there, it takes away a significant portion of that radiation. It also frees up the folks here on Frostalin to do a little bit more tasks around this colony. And for now, that is with growing bristle blossoms and some sweet wheat that I'm still perfecting the exact temperature we need to bring that water in at. The great thing is it's eventually going to start working. We just gotta drive that temperature down a little bit more, and that's because of this system here. All of the salt water that is coming in from this salt water geyser starts at 95C. It goes through the desalinator and is still around 90 degrees. Well, that's when it starts entering this loop. Well, instantly it goes from that 90 degrees all the way down to about 8 to 10 degrees on this first pass. We split off half of it immediately to feed our bristle blossoms, and the other half continuously goes around to be chilled where that much colder water will eventually be fed to our sleet wheat. The water continues on down, passes through some radiant liquid pipes in order to cool the farm down a little bit before eventually being fed to the sleet wheat. And you can see that water is coming in at 4.2 degrees. By the time it gets over to this side, it's 5 Hence the reason why it's still warming up some of these hydroponic farms and causing the sleet wheat to be a little bit too warm. But as this water continuously flows in, it will continue to drive down that temperature where eventually we'll have a 100% functional sleet wheat farm. Well, once again, that's the theory. I just realized the primary reason is because we're emptying this liquid reservoir and feeding it back and this water is up over five degrees. So we're gonna get rid of that and go dump that water elsewhere. Over on Ariel, we're having a couple of issues. Jack died has ran out of dirt, so he can't change out the outhouse, and which that's causing problems going to the bathroom. Let's go ahead and get some of this mopped up. We'll put the clean water back in here, and hopefully be able to get rid of all this polluted water as well. And that way our pitcher pump has access to the clean water to feed to the wash basin. Luckily, we do have a source of more regular dirt, and that's because we now have access to clay. So we're going to get all of these removed, replace them with clay, and that'll give us another half a ton of dirt to be able to feed the outhouse. You might be wondering where we got the clay. Well, we just put some polluted water over here and then started deodorizing it. We have plenty of sand on this planetoid, so it was an easy method to get some clay to replace those planter boxes. But despite the mess going on over here, Ariel itself is the reason why we originally started building the Radbolt reactor. But since we were doing it, I figured just a lot better to, to do the applied sciences over here instead of on Frostalin. But all those Radbolts are eventually going to be fed to some interplanetary launchers. But I figured we'd knock out the research first so that we can put that behind us. But the sooner we do that, the sooner we can get Jack here some of the needed materials to be able to make this colony self-sufficient. And that's going to be in the form of a little bit of steel and a little bit of plastic. We're going to take all this hydrogen, feed it to both hydrogen generators and possibly even this anti-entropy thermonullifier so we can provide some additional cooling so we can access this hot polluted oxygen vent, which will eventually provide oxygen for this colony and tame the liquid sulfur geyser wherever it's hiding out, which my guess is going to be somewhere down in here. And now with those dirt farm tiles destroyed, Jack finally has some visits remaining in the outhouse. That 500 kilos of dirt should be plenty, considering it only takes 13 kilos of dirt per use until we can get some more supplies shipped over here. There was a few different considerations that went into the design of this Radbolt reactor. First, we wanted to build this in the space biome, and that way we'll have easy access to those Radbolts when we are feeding them to the interplanetary launchers. Second, I knew whatever structure we were going to build needed to be made out of glass. The glass allows the light to come through, and that way we can still provide power to these solar panels. 
The only area that it's not is this metal door. I could have put a liquid lock here instead of the metal door. That way we can keep the oxygen in here, but the one ray of light isn't too big of a deal to sacrifice from this one solar panel. So why did we want to oxygenate this place anyways? Well, we didn't have to oxygenate it. We could have used any sort of environment. But the primary reason is to keep the rad bolt generators and the auto sweepers cold. Luckily, the Weezwarts do a good job of cooling everything around. We just needed to provide them an environment to be able to do that in. The radiation? It's pretty good. Especially considering there's no natural source of radiation on this colony. Like wrecked satellites or any sort of uranium ore. Both of these rad bolt generators are getting 185 rad bolts per cycle. And this little fella up here is collecting about 130. I kept playing with the design a little bit. In fact, I might be able to spin this down, remove this one Weezwort, and then put both of these here. Let me make that change real quick and see if it increases the amount of rad collection we can get. It looks like the other configuration was a little bit better. Now the centermost rad bolt generator is getting 185, but the two on the sides are only getting 160. At a minimum though, it's a bit more symmetrical. One of the limitations of doing it this way with the Weezworts in this sort of V formation was the auto sweeper. The auto sweeper needs to be able to hit the planter boxes to be able to provide them with all the phosphorite they need to continue generating all that radiation. But when you put an auto sweeper in there, you still need room for the rad bolt generators. But overall, even if we left it like this, this is still almost 500 rad bolts per cycle, which definitely works for us. And we could make another reactor just like this. But the magic number of rad bolt generators is still going to end up being three because they cost the 480 watts a piece. We did end up putting some automation on this. And that way, whenever the material study terminal is full, it kills the rad bolt generators, not only saving us power, but also preventing extra rad bolts from continuously firing. There's a couple of other things we could have done. For instance, open this window tile up and have it feed into either another material study terminal. But I didn't like the prospect of leaving this room open to the environment as it would cost us even more oxygen. Because then the oxygen would just continuously vent out into the environment and I thought that was a bit wasteful. Regardless though, the material study terminal isn't going to be here for much longer. We only have a few more items to research and then we'll be able to rip out all the science buildings. A couple other minor updates that happened in the background. We're now also pumping this polluted water into a water sieve to supply more water for our research needs, but also because I want to get this area drained and that way we can use this area for another system or two that we design in the future. We also completely ripped out the system that was pumping steam out. If you recall, we were using little one kilo packets of steam, cooling them down, dropping them, which would form water that we were creating a little bit more oxygen with just to feed to the oxalite refineries. But now that we're creating such a surplus of oxygen from this system, we just fed off a line. So whenever we do need some oxalite, we can just flip the switch and it'll get working and still have a very steady flow of oxygen being provided to it. We also discovered when we moved that oxygen system and then rerouted the conveyor rails with the polluted dirt on them, that it was significantly heating up some of the surrounding areas and even caused these trees to stifle for a little while. But since we had a cooling loop cooling that oxygen system anyways, we just put some metal tiles around it, and now it's actually cooling the polluted dirt. And then finally, I have to show you the most unlucky cuddle pip in the history of cuddle pips. This cuddle pip is living inside this facility, and it has 2,200 kilos of carbon dioxide in every single tile. How did it happen? Come to find out there was one piece of rail that was connected wrong in this bridge, but it's so hard to see because you can't see behind the bridge. So every once in a while, things would end up going into our ethanol refinery and hence the reason why the Cuddle Pip has a very uncomfortable home. We're also adding in a couple of more conveyor loaders because we're occasionally having pip eggs that are stuck in here. Remember, the pip eggs used to be going to an egg cracker, and until very recently, that's how it stayed. We've now added pip eggs to this run. It goes through all of our filter systems and then ends up in the evolution chamber, just like all the other critters in this colony. A couple of other smaller updates. First, this gold volcano. You may notice that there's something wrong 
For some reason, each one of these bottom tiles has over 10 tons of liquid gold. The top ones have 7.5 tons of liquid gold. My only guess is somehow the carbon dioxide is preventing the gold volcano from stifling and we've accidentally made a infinite liquid gold storage tank. Whatever we're gonna do with that, I don't know. We also have a new duplicate to report. Say hi to Bubbles. Bubbles is an operator builder who also enjoys murdering plants and doesn't like critters too much. Welcome to the colony, Dave Hammer. Before I let you go, I figured I'd give you a nice update on the Sleetweed farm. We added a bit of automation to be able to bring the dirt in here for a couple of reasons. First, we want the dirt to sit in here for a little while before being fed to the Sleetweed. This way, the dirt's not coming in directly at like 50 degrees and then stifling some of the crops, which after observing this for a little bit, seemed like it was definitely happening. We also made sure that the flow will always continue with this water line. Once it passes through and the sleet weight takes as much water as it wants, it's sent right back in to the original system, where it'll then be recooled if need be and fed back to the crops. This continuous flow really allows us to keep the temperature in this farm as low as possible. That's about it for this week's episode. I apologize again for the shorter nature of this video, but I at least wanted to give you something. And in the eventuality that I don't have power tomorrow or Saturday, this at least ensures there's a video out there for you to watch. I hope all of you stay safe in your own neck of the woods. And until next time, I'll talk to you soon.